Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of successful individuals from around the world. I'm your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm privileged to welcome a very senior and respected professional from San Antonio, Texas, Mr. Milton Stark. Milton, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, Milton is a speaker. He's an author and a consultant. He has extensive experience in the in, in, in the energy industry and is working on his book, The Sixth W of Project Management, which is scheduled for release in early 2024. So, Milton, before we talk about energy, tell me a little bit about your own journey in brief. Well, <laughs> I started out a very, very long time ago as a theater arts major with ambitions for Broadway. Wow. In, uh, I was going to college. I laid out of school for a quarter because I ran out of money. I was funding my own, my own process. I ran out of money, laid out a quarter to go to work and made a discovery that in the United States in 1968, laying out of school puts you right at the top of the selective service list. And instead of continuing in my education to be an actor, I became a soldier with a new wife and a three-year-old son. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I had to make some choices. Life, it's kind of where I'm going with the book, I think, is that, that life is simply a series of choices. Correct. And uh, so I, I had to make some choices then, and that ended me up in uh, power production in the service. Started out with little little bitty DC machines called motor gens. Mm -hmm. And uh, from that, when I separated from the military in 1977, I had moved on up as a nuclear power plant operator and instrument technician. Amazing. Amazing. So from 1977, when I separated until about 25 years ago, uh, I spent most of my time working in the commercial nuclear industry throughout the throughout the country. Mm -hmm. uh, my initial endeavor was to do outage maintenance in the instrumentation area. Mm -hmm. um, but it rapidly it rapidly changed. Uh, one of the big things for me as let me back up just a second. In the nuclear power industry in the United States, Mm. Initially, and still continuing to this day, a very large number of the uh, operators and maintenance people and, and senior people in the industry and stuff come out of the military nuclear program, either the nuclear Navy, most of all, only the nuclear Navy now, because the Army program ended in 1977, which mm. corresponded with when I got out of the service. Mm. So... The, the long story short, in 1979, when they had the accident at Three Mile Island, that was another one of those pivoting points for me. I was working as a uh, project lead, <clears throat> excuse me, on a maintenance project in uh, Nebraska. I got a phone call. My boss said, be on an airplane uh, headed for Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, as soon as you can get there. Mm -hmm. Um, I was selected to go to Three Mile as part of the recovery team at Three Mile mm. because the previous job before I went to Nebraska was at Three Mile Island doing a modification on the reactor drive, the uh, safety drive system in Unit 1. Of course, the accident was at Unit 2. Ooh. But I had, I was still badged for three mile. Mm. So I didn't have to go through any training processes or anything. So uh, I was on an airplane and back and, and by the 1st of April, I was on site and starting to work toward the, mm. the recovery of Three Mile Island. And so Milton, I want to move a little bit uh, towards, you know, uh, the, the different forms of energy and I'd love to get some of your perspectives. 
given the fact that we have a little bit of a time constraint. Uh, you, when I was reading and preparing for my conversation with you, uh, you, you believe there is a balance necessary between traditional sources of energy and renewable sources of energy. Tell me why. Uh, okay. Um, we have pretty much established a goal uh, politically and socially, we've established a goal for going to renewable power within a specific period of time. Yeah. yeah. Worldwide, that goal is unattainable. Mm -hmm. Not because it's not a good idea, mm -hmm. but because it's physically unattainable. Mm -hmm. We can't do all of the things that would be necessary to make that total transition. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the things that's concerning me at this point is our our very existence on the face of the earth mm -hmm. literally depends on the utilization of energy, the utilization mm -hmm. of power. Mm -hmm. We use an inordinately large amount of that currently as electrical energy. And we want to go even more of that toward electrical energy. And mm -hmm. I think, I think we need to back up and look at where we are, mm -hmm. what we have, how we're going to get there mm -hmm. and actually make a plan. And that's not happening any place in the world that I've seen. Mm -hmm. No one is really looking at a comprehensive plan as to how we get from where we are to where we want to be. Right. We have a lot of individual plans. This group is planning to do this and that group is planning to do that. But we're not using any kind of synergy between those plans and those efforts to try to figure out where we need to go in the long term. Mm -hmm. In the short term, we cannot stop producing energy mm -hmm. by fossil means. Correct. The, the concept of a transition is the closest thing to a plan that we have. It's a concept of a transition. Mm -hmm. But that transition is a myriad of technical issues and problems that have to be overcome. Right. Not not the least of which with our current technology, it's virtually it's not possible with our current technology to provide our electrical system using wind and solar energy. And the reason for that is that in order to connect all of this stuff together and make it work, the system requires a certain amount of inertia mm -hmm. in wind and solar energy because the, the, the energy that's developed actually has to be transitioned for us to use it in the first place. Right. It either has to be changed from a variable AC into a standard AC, which is many of the solar, I mean, the wind plants. Mm -hmm. And of course, solar is DC, low voltage DC, mm -hmm. which has to be then transformed and changed into our usable grid voltages. Mm -hmm. Those things happen both in both cases. We use inverters to make that happen. And one of the great things about inverters is that they respond very quickly. Mm -hmm. One of the problems with inverters is they respond very quickly. There's mm -hmm. no inertia in the okay. system. Okay. <laughs> okay. So that inertia in the system is created by literally by the inertia of the spinning machines that we currently use to create electricity. The mm. generators themselves create that inertia. Mm. Very interesting. We, we've got things going in process, but today you can't, you can't run a power grid just based on solar mm. and wind energy mm. because of this transmission and utilization problem. Mm. Mm. Now that's a grid. Yeah, I understand. So, if you make it small, mm -hmm. such as a wind and solar unit that's providing power to a small residential community, mm -hmm. we can make that work. We have inverters that that will, with a little bit of help, we can, we've can. we got the technology to make those work. But when mm -hmm. we start trying to expand into the overall system, mm -hmm. we still have to have a majority of the power system with that inertia to keep mm -hmm. everything running. So mm -hmm. that's a technical problem. We're working on it. Yeah. I mean, there's but, a 
but tell me milton in terms of and the amount of experience you have you you are the best person to answer this there are two different aspects of traditional and renewable sources of energy one is the cost of course and i understand uh, you, you know the, the the renewable sources are more expensive but the second part is also the need for managing carbon emissions and climate change and so on and so forth what is yes. your perspective on both these the basically the carbon issue is the issue that's driving our social and political situation forward um going to renewable energies reducing our carbon i have no issue with that goal mm. at all mm. uh, i think i i wrote a, a letter to a friend of mine talking about this stuff and i said that the effort to go to renewable energy sources mm -hmm. is not a fool's errand mm -hmm. but we are approaching it like fools mm -hmm. so my issue is not with the goal not where we want to go mm -hmm. it's what we're doing to get there and i think a big part of this and the reason that that I'm out trying to speak and and get out here and so on is there's a public perception that the only reason that we're not 100% renewable primarily uh wind and solar today is because these large corporations that are running all the oil won't play with us. Mm. Well, they really don't drive the bus. They might mm. think they do and a lot of us think they do, but they mm. don't. Hmm. those decisions aren't made by those people those decisions are made by us by you hmm. and me and george and fred and you know the, yeah. we decide where we're going to go with this hmm. but right now we're trying to make that decision with an insufficient amount of information to make an intelligent decision hmm. and my goal is to try to get people to look at some of the technical issues and where we have to go and realize that a transition from one source of energy to another source of energy regardless of what type you call it mm -hmm. there are technical issues that must be resolved and the mm -hmm. underlying current of that is we cannot survive we cannot live without that energy mm -hmm. so we have a very large percentage of of fossil disregard nuclear for a moment mm -hmm. because it really <laughs> Nuclear is not renewable but it provides so many of the benefits that the renewable energy produces mm -hmm. it's definitely one of the things we should yeah. be looking at. Mm -hmm. But if we look just at fossil and burning of fossil fuels that still provides the majority of our electrical production throughout the world today mm -hmm. and our push to go more electrical with with the transportation sector alone. Mm -hmm constitutes an energy usage of a I don't know I don't know what the exact numbers are but I know mm -hmm. it it revolves around 20% of our energy usage worldwide is used for transport for shipping things for driving your mm -hmm. car for getting from point A to point yeah. B if we convert all of that to electrical during a time when we're trying to transition a lot of stuff we're increasing our demand by 20% over the top of what we already have mm -hmm. very interesting and i think an interesting piece of this puzzle that most people that i talk to just absolutely do not understand fossil fuels coal and oil well, let's let's go with coal which is the really bad one mm -hmm. They run an energy efficiency about generally for base coal they run higher than 85%. Mm. When you get into nuclear they run an efficiency uh close to 97-98%. Mm. We've actually had coal plant I mean nuclear plants that produced 104%, mm. which is an interesting but a different story. Mm. So when we talk about the power in the world electrical power in the world mm -hmm. we always talk about the capability mm -hmm. so 
As an example, if I have uh, a megawatt of coal energy that's available, that's how everybody, we have a megawatt of mm -hmm. coal, mm -hmm. okay? And we have a megawatt of wind, must go with, with solar. Mm -hmm. so we have a megawatt of solar, okay? Mm -hmm. Those two numbers, a megawatt of coal and a megawatt of solar, are the capacity numbers. Mm -hmm. But no systems don't operate mm -hmm. at capacity for either very little time or no time at all. Right. Okay? So if I have a coal plant and it's operating at 85% capacity at 85% of its capacity that's called a power factor in the industry if its power mm -hmm. factor is is 0.85 mm -hmm. that means that it's actually producing 0.85 megawatts mm -hmm. okay because it has an efficiency around 85% right. right there's no solar to my knowledge existing in the world that exceeds 40%. Okay. Most of it's down around 35%. Mm. So when I see this thing and they say, our grid capacity is a, a megawatt of coal and a megawatt of, of solar, mm -hmm. that tells me, just those two words alone tells me that 85% of my power is coming from coal mm. and maybe 30% Maybe even less than that's actually coming from solar. Very interesting. You know, I, I, I'm glad you've told me about this because I had no idea there are such dramatic efficiency factors between <laughs> coal and, uh, and uh, solar. But the other question that I wanted to ask you, Milton, is uh, that if you look at energy across the world, yes, there are cultural practices you know some people want yes, there are. thermal some people want hydel then of course there's the entire thing of uh, wind there is uh, 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 you know there's this thing about uh, other forms of renewable solar for example mm -hmm. do you think cultural norms and practices have uh, hindered or speeded up adoption of renewable I really don't think of it in the terms of whether they speed up or hinder because as strong as our cultural functions are, mm -hmm. there's no culture that doesn't change given the appropriate pressures. Correct. So on and so forth. So Correct. I suppose... Uh, in, in general terms, that many of the cultural issues are kind of slowing things down a little bit. Mm -hmm. But there's one piece of culture. I don't care. I don't care what your religion, your function, your place mm -hmm. in the world is. I don't care what it is. If you are a human being, there is one aspect of your culture mm -hmm. that we all share. Right. We don't like change. Correct. Okay, and what we're talking about is not a small change. Mm. So at some point deep in your soul, every human being out there on the face of the earth has some reservation, some issue with what it is we're trying to do mm. just on the basis that it's changed. Mm. You've got a, a smaller group of people yeah. that you know, really want to do it because it's change, mm -hmm. not because it's good, not but, but just because it's change. But for the most part, we don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And this, those kinds of problems is kind of what's driving my position that we need to have a comprehensive approach over a long period of time mm -hmm. and not just a group of politicians, no matter how hard they think and how wonderful they they think their ideas are for a group of world politicians to get up and say, we will do this by 2050 mm -hmm. is in my mind, it is not useless. It's counterproductive mm -hmm. because now we've got a whole lot of the population thinking this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's not. Mm -hmm. 
It's just not going to happen. It's, mm. And again, it's not. I'm not saying that because I think it shouldn't happen. I'm saying that because the realities of doing what we're talking about doing mm. just don't exist. Mm. Very interesting. So Milton, There's, I've got time for one more question and I want to move to your forthcoming book. Okay. Uh, sixth W of Project Management. Tell okay. me a little bit about your book and what is your hypothesis when you decided to write this book? I decided to write this book after working with several industrial companies with their project management mm -hmm. programs and finding out that their project management programs, they really just don't work. Mm -hmm. And so I went back and did a little bit of research and I found that worldwide, every kind of project, and there's a big thing going on now between uh, kind of hardware, software, construction versus software development mm -hmm. and the methodologies that are involved. Okay. And I thought, well, maybe one's better than the other. And I'm, uh, well, mm -hmm. it turns out that it doesn't matter what kind of project you have mm -hmm. or what methodology you're currently using in order to get that project done. 30% of the projects undertaken worldwide are budget buster failures. Mm -hmm. Okay. They completely do nothing except spend money. Mm. Only 30%. It's actually less than 30%. I think uh, I got a lot of my data out of the project management Institute in Right now, I think their data is running around the neighborhood of 28% of the projects undertaken worldwide actually are successful projects. Mm -hmm. And being a successful project means on time, under budget, and you accomplished your goals. Mm -hmm. It's only three things. It's not a real complicated issue. Mm -hmm. But we have 28% of the that are being successful at that. Why? Mm -hmm. That's that's what my book is about. Mm -hmm. Why are we having such a massive failure rate and what can we do about it? Mm -hmm. Sixth W, I call it the little W. Mm -hmm. If you go back, probably any place that I've ever had any kind of study about doing research, developing, writing a paper, when you were in elementary school, some teacher told you that when you write a paper, you write a paper using the five W's. Mm -hmm. What, when, where, who, and why. Yeah. Right. There's one W that we do not consider in that. Mm -hmm. And it's the little W, mm -hmm. not a big W. Mm -hmm. It's the little W that's on the back end of how. Mm -hmm. Okay. Answering the questions, who, what, when, where, and why, define the project but they don't get the project done. It's the little W on the back of the how that gets the project done. Mm. And what happens to us on many, many, many projects, that little W is a significant part of the plan. And we're not really looking at the plan until after we've committed mm. to the budget, the schedule, and the activities that we want to complete. Now that we've committed those, now we go back and look at how. We need to change that around. And I've got some ideas and some philosophies and stuff on how we go about that. Fascinating. I'm going to, I'm looking forward to the publication of your book and hopefully we'll uh, have another conversation on the little W. Uh, I want to just say, Milton, we've come, run out of time. So I want to say thank you so much for You're speaking welcome. to me about your journey. Thank you for sp speaking to me about so many different aspects of traditional and renewable energy. I think I learned many new things from you. Thank you for speaking to me and good luck. Thank you very much. Enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.